Welcome back, everybody, uh, to another deep dive. You know, this one is about, uh, well, this heartbreaking event from Sunday evening, a helicopter crash in Houston. Oh, yeah. This one's really tough. Yeah, we've got a whole stack of news articles here, and, you know, they're just, uh, it's a lot to take in. Yeah. A Robinson R-44 helicopter just slammed right into a radio tower. Huge radio tower, too. Yeah. Crazy. He caused a fire. Tragically killed everyone on board. Yeah, and including a child. Yeah. It's um. So there are a lot of details here as I'm looking through these articles that are just you know, kind of jarring. Yeah, I can imagine. Like the fact that the helicopter was on an air tour flight. Oh, when it crashed. Yeah, and then you've got this whole thing with the radio tower's ownership. I really? Yeah, it had just changed hands. Hmm. And then they're also asking residents to help search for debris oh, and potentially God. human remains. Oh, man. Yeah, so it's a lot to unpack here. That's a lot. So I'm hoping you can kind of help us, you know, understand not just what happened, but, you know, what it all means. Well, I mean, you know, what's interesting here is that we're not just dealing with a tragic accident. Yeah. You know, it's this event. It raises so many questions, you know, about helicopter safety. Right. Especially in the context of these air tours. Mm -hmm. You know, the complexities of managing critical infrastructure. Yeah. And even the community's role mm -hmm. in the aftermath of this kind of disaster. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, let's start with the crash itself. Okay. So, I mean, you know, when I think about a plane crash or a helicopter crash... I'm thinking about the investigators on scene, you know, pouring over every inch of that engine, looking for the tiniest clue. Oh, yeah, I'm saying um, You know, and these eyewitnesses, they're describing this bright light that quickly turned into an orange-red fireball as the helicopter hit the tower. Yeah. I can't even imagine witnessing that. No, it's wild. One of the witnesses was actually at a nearby golf course. Oh, wow. Saw the tower collapse almost instantly. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That is, uh, that's terrifying. Yeah, the impact on those living nearby. Yeah. You know, I can't imagine one resident said it sounded like a bomb went off. Oh, my gosh. He was lucky the tower fell away from his house. Yeah, that just sent chills down my spine. Yeah. It really brings home the human cost of these accidents. And yeah. then you add in, you yeah. know, the residents being asked to search for debris. Oh, gosh. Potentially even human remains. Yeah. That's a, that's a grim task. And it really, you know, speaks to the sheer magnitude of this impact. Yeah, it does. And every piece of debris, every eyewitness account is crucial for the investigation. Yeah. Speaking of which, you've got a real alphabet soup of agencies involved here. Right. HPD, HFD, FAA, NTSB. It's like a massive puzzle with everyone trying to find their piece. Yeah. They're combing through this huge four acre search area. Mm hmm even using 3D scanning to map the scene. So this is going to be, you know, this investigation is going to be really fascinating. Oh, yeah. No black box, right? Yeah, exactly. So unlike commercial airliners, you know, this type of helicopter, right. the Robinson R-44 Raven II yep. doesn't have a black box, so no flight recorder. So investigators have to get creative. They're relying on things like eyewitness accounts, the physical debris, whatever data they can pull from the helicopter's instruments. It's like a giant three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. So let's talk about this Robinson R44. Okay. So you mentioned air tours, and I know, you know, the NTSB has actually been pushing for stricter regulations on air tour operators who use this particular helicopter. The R44. Yeah, given its accident history. So this crash might, you know, kind of add fuel to that fire. It very well could. Yeah. And remember, air tours can be anything from, you know, quick sightseeing trips over the city. Right. Two more specialized flights. Oh, okay. So investigators will be looking into what kind of tour this was, where the helicopter was headed, mm -hmm. and what the typical routes are, you know, for similar flights in Houston. Yeah, like a forensic investigation, but in the air. Exactly. Um, we do know that the helicopter was registered to a company called Porter Equipment Holdings. Okay. But they've been silent so far, so. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So let's shift gears to the radio tower now. It was massive, 1,000 feet tall, used by Univision's Comma FM. Wow. This whole ownership thing is where it gets really interesting. Okay. How so? So Univision says they sold the tower in September. Okay. Just a month before the crash. Right. But according to FCC records, they still owned it. Oh, so there's like a bit of a gray area. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So SPA Communications, the company that supposedly bought the tower, says they're cooperating with the investigation. Okay. They're a real estate investment trust. Right. So they own tons of these towers. Sure. And they're emphasizing, you know, their commitment to keeping the tower safe and operational. Yeah. 
But it kind of raises some red flags. Yeah, I could see that. About how these ownership changes are communicated. Sure. Especially, you know, when you're dealing with something as potentially dangerous as a 1,000 foot tower. You would think, you know, there would be some kind of system in place. Right. If there's any lag, you know, between the actual sale and the updated records, uh -huh. things could get messy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that could impact safety protocols. Of course. It's definitely something investigators are going to be looking into. Right. Because we often talk about pilot error or mechanical failure right. in these types of accidents. But this, you know, situation shines a light on the administrative side of things. Oh, yeah. The paperwork, the communication. The, the handoff between owners, mm -hmm. all that's crucial. Yeah, and this crash happened in a part of East Downtown that's been undergoing a lot of change recently. Oh, really? Yeah, you've got these new high-rises being built right next to industrial sites. Oh, wow. It raises questions about zoning risk assessment, mm. you know, even the preparedness of emergency responders. It's something to watch as the investigation unfolds. It's a great point. Mm -hmm. You know, this area is a fascinating microcosm of urban change. Yeah. This crash could force some tough conversations about how we manage those changes, especially when it comes to safety. OK, so we've got the immediate impact, you know, the tragic loss of life, the debris field, the disruption to the neighborhood. Yeah. But this is going to have ripple effects, right? Oh, absolutely. Wow, yeah. I think we'll see a renewed focus on helicopter safety regulations, mm -hmm. especially for air tours. Right. And probably on how ownership transfers of critical infrastructure are handled. You know, there could even be legal ramifications yeah. for the helicopter operator, the tower owners, maybe even the manufacturers. Right. It's uh, it's a lot to think about. Yeah. And then on a human level. Oh, of course. There's the trauma experienced by the families of the victims, the first responders who were there that night, even the residents, you know, who are now living in the shadow of this tragedy. Right. It's a stark reminder that these events, you know, what we call them accidents, they have profound and lasting consequences. Before we move on, I want to touch on a few details from these articles that really stood out to me. Okay. One mentioned that firefighters from a nearby station were actually among the first to respond. Oh, wow. Yeah. They heard the crash and they immediately sprang to action. They must have been just heartbroken. Yeah. You know, these firefighters aren't just trained professionals. Yeah. They're also members of this community directly impacted by this tragedy. Yeah. It really speaks to their dedication and bravery. And Mayor Whitmire was also there that night. Oh, really? Yeah, addressing the media and the community. He mentioned that there were gas tanks stored near the crash site. Oh, no. He said the damage could have been even worse oh, gosh. if those tanks had ignited. That's chilling. Yeah. You know, it makes you realize that what we see in those initial reports right. is only part of the story. Yeah. There are always these potential secondary disasters lurking beneath the surface. Wow. And this highlights the importance of thinking ahead you know, anticipating the worst case scenarios. Absolutely. So where do we go from here? What are the big questions that we should be asking as more information comes out? Well, you know, without the black box, investigators have to rely on radar data, assuming the helicopter's transponder was working. Right. It's like a digital breadcrumb trail, but it's not always reliable. Right. I'd be very interested to see their analysis of the helicopter's flight path. No. Were there any distress calls, any indication of mechanical issues? Yeah. And then there's the whole ownership issue with the tower. Right. You know, were all the necessary safety protocols in place during that transition period? Were there any communication breakdowns that might have contributed to this? These are all questions that need to be answered. Mm. As you're reading through these articles, what stands out to you? What questions are on your mind? Mm. This investigation is far from over, and it's important for all of us to stay informed, ask tough questions, and learn from this tragedy. I couldn't agree more. Every incident like this offers an opportunity to reflect, right. to improve, and hopefully prevent something like this from happening again. Let's take a moment to really absorb everything we've discussed so far. And when we come back, we'll delve deeper into the helicopter's journey that evening and the challenges investigators face in piecing together what happened in those final moments. OK, so we're back, and I'm still thinking about those gas tanks. Oh, yeah. Near the crash site. It's pretty scary. Yeah. It's a reminder of just how quickly things could have spiraled, you know, even further out of control. Absolutely. But for now, let's shift our focus back to the helicopter itself. OK. So we know it took off from Ellington Field, but where it was headed that evening is still a mystery. Yeah, that's a key piece of the puzzle, for sure. And without the black box, you know, investigators are relying on other methods to trace the helicopter's path. Right. It's like trying to retrace your steps after you've lost your phone. Oh, yeah. You might remember certain landmarks or turns you made. Right. And that's what investigators are doing here, but on a much larger scale. So they're looking at radar data, hoping that 
the helicopter's transponder, you know, was sending out a signal. Right, like a digital breadcrumb trail. Yeah. But it's not always reliable. Right, and they'll be going through any communication the pilot had with air traffic control. Of course. Trying to piece together a timeline. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And they're also going to be looking at those typical air tour routes that we talked about. Right. Comparing them to any witness accounts and the location of the debris field. You know, if they can narrow down where this helicopter was flying, it might lead them to more evidence or even more witnesses. Speaking of evidence, the NTSB is going to be taking that mangled wreckage to a secure facility. Right. What can they actually learn from a pile of twisted metal? Well, you have to imagine analyzing, you know, the twist of a rotor blade or the way the radio tower's steel beams were sheared. Mm -hmm. Those details tell a story about the forces at play and can help investigators reconstruct you know, those final moments. Right. They'll be looking for any signs of a mechanical issue. Okay. A stress fracture, a faulty part, anything that might have caused the helicopter to malfunction. It really is like a giant three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle, isn't it? It is. And each piece, from the smallest screw to the largest chunk of the fuselage, could hold a vital clue. Okay, so we've got the physical evidence, but what about the human element? Right. What will investigators be looking into when it comes to the pilot and the passengers? Well, the pilots training their flight hours, their medical history, even what they were doing in the days leading up to the crash. Wow. It all becomes relevant. Were they properly certified to be flying air tours? Were they fatigued? Had they consumed anything that could have affected their performance? Right. These are all sensitive questions, but they're crucial to understanding what might have led to this tragedy. And what about the passengers? Does their information play a role in the investigation? It might. Investigators will want to know who they were, their relationship to the pilot, even the purpose of their flight. Okay. Were they family, friends, business associates? Was this a planned trip or something more spontaneous? Right. Sometimes those seemingly small details can provide a lot of context. It's all about understanding the bigger picture. Right. I know these investigations take time, especially without that black box data. You're right. NTSB investigations are incredibly thorough, and they can take months, even years, to complete. They want to be absolutely sure of their findings before releasing a final report. So while we wait for those findings, what can we as informed listeners do to stay engaged with this story and contribute to the conversation around helicopter safety? I mean, it's easy to feel helpless after something like this happens. Well, I think the most important thing is to stay informed, follow reputable news sources, look for updates from the NTSB, and be careful about spreading rumors or speculation. Right. Those can actually do more harm than good, especially when an investigation's ongoing. That's a great point. And what about engaging with the broader issues we've been talking about, like air tour safety and infrastructure management? That's crucial, too. We can all learn more about the Robinson R-44 and its safety record. Mm -hmm. We can look into the regulations around air tours and how they're enforced. And we can support organizations that are pushing for improvements in those areas. Knowledge is power, as they say. And on a more local level, we can show support for the victims' families and the first responders. They're going through something unimaginable right now. Absolutely. Even small gestures like donating to a relief fund or simply offering words of support can make a difference. It's all about reminding each other that we're in this together. That sense of community seems so important, especially in times like these. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here from the immediate aftermath of the crash to the ongoing investigation and the bigger picture of helicopter safety. But there's still one piece of this puzzle we haven't really explored, the radio tower itself. Right. That silent giant at the yeah. center of it all. And as you mentioned earlier, there are still some unanswered questions about its ownership at the time of the crash. Exactly. Who was ultimately responsible for that tower? And could any communication breakdowns have played a role in this tragedy? We'll dive into all of that when we come back for the final part of our deep dive. Okay, so we're back and it's time to, uh, you know, really tackle that silent giant in this whole story, the radio tower. Yeah. It was a landmark in the Houston skyline, 1,000 feet tall, you know, beaming out Univision's comma FM radio station. Right. But as we've learned, the ownership was uh, a bit of a tangled web at the time of the crash. It really was. Univision says they sold it to SBA Communications back in September just weeks before the accident. Right. But the official FCC records still listed Univision as the owner. Huh. That discrepancy raises a lot of questions about, you know, responsibility and accountability. Yeah. It's like if you sold your car but forgot to tell the DMV and then someone got into an accident with it. Right. Who's ultimately responsible? Yeah. That's a great analogy. And it makes you wonder, you know, if there's confusion about who's in charge of a massive structure like that. Oh. What happens to the safety 
checks the maintenance. Exactly. And those things are critical, especially for something as tall as a radio tower. Yeah. You know, pilots rely on accurate information about these structures to navigate safely. Right. If there's a delay in updating crucial safety information like the notice dare missions right. or NOTAM for short. Yeah. It could have serious consequences. But, and speaking of NOTAMs, I remember reading that SBA Communications did issue one after they acquired the tower advising pilots to exercise caution during the ownership transition. Okay. But was that enough? Could there have been other communication breakdowns that contributed to this tragedy? Those are the million dollar questions. And I'm sure the investigators are digging into them as we speak. They'll want to know exactly what that NOTAM said, how it was distributed, and whether both Univision and SBA Communications did everything they could to ensure a smooth and safe handover. It's not just about pointing fingers. It's about understanding how this happened and making sure it doesn't happen again. It really makes you realize that even something as seemingly simple as, you know, buying and selling a tower mm. involves this whole web of procedures and uh, protocols. Yeah. yeah. And when those procedures break down, uh -huh. the consequences can be devastating, as we've seen. Absolutely. It's a stark reminder that safety isn't just about technology or regulations. Right. It's about clear communication, meticulous record keeping, and a shared sense of responsibility. Yeah, I'm hoping this crash will lead to some real changes in how these ownership transfers are handled. With a much stronger emphasis on transparency and those robust safety protocols that you mentioned. I agree. It's tragic that it takes an event like this to expose these vulnerabilities. Right. But if it leads to positive change, then at least some good can come out of it. We've really gone deep on this one, haven't we? We have. We've covered the crash itself, the ongoing investigation, the helicopter's journey, the complexities of the radio tower ownership and the potential causes and lasting impact. It's been a, a lot to process, but incredibly insightful. It has, and it's highlighted just how interconnected all these systems are. Right. Aviation safety, infrastructure management, communication protocols, and even the community's role in responding to a disaster. As you continue to explore these articles and maybe even do some additional research on your own, remember to be critical of the information you encounter. Right. Look for reliable sources, consider the different perspectives involved, and keep asking those tough questions. And most importantly, don't lose sight of the human element in all of this. The families who lost loved ones, the first responders who witnessed the unimaginable, the residents who are still grappling with the aftermath, their stories matter, and their voices deserve to be heard. That's a powerful reminder. This crash was more than just a news event. It was a tragedy that touched countless lives as we move forward. Let's honor those lives by working towards a future where such tragedies are less likely to occur. Well said by understanding what happened, why it happened, and what we can do to prevent it from happening again. We can create a safer world for everyone. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive. It's been a sobering but important journey. Until next time, stay curious, stay informed, and stay engaged.